I was in the second grade. I was invited to a birthday party at a miniature golf course. The birthday girl and all of the other party guests were third graders. I'd never been to a party where I was the only pipsqueak there, and I'd never been to a miniature golf course. I know, right? What's wrong with my parents? I, I had second grade, never been to a miniature golf course. I was a bit overdressed. I was a lot intimidated. I was uncomfortable. No one else had started the course since we'd arrived, and so I wasn't really sure what to expect. I didn't know what to do. Then the birthday girl said the worst possible thing. Joyce, you're the youngest, so you go first. <laughs> At my current age, in a similar situation, I'd say, that's not going to happen. Y'all, I have no idea what I'm doing. You show me, I will go there. Yeah, second grader me didn't have that level of confidence. So I stepped up to the rubber mat. I put the ball down in front of me. I studied myself, right? Clearly, I'm not a golfer yet. You see where this is going, don't you? All I could think of was, just do it like they do it on TV. <laughs> yeah, just like that. <laughs> so I curled up my body, and I whacked that ball as hard as I could. It sailed. <laughs> higher and higher, right over the fence, and onto the freeway. <laughs> the freeway. See, I still didn't know if that was good or bad, because everybody seemed to applaud when the guys on TV hit it like really far and high. I was confined to the edges for the rest of that party. And I stayed confined to the edges of that girl's life for years. Our parents were friends, so there was a lot of forced togetherness. But I was always aware that I didn't belong, and she'd rather I just disappear. I saw that happen to other people in high school, in college, and in adult spaces like workplaces and churches. I'm not proud of the times that I wittingly and unwittingly participated in pushing people to the edges. In Ephesians 4, Paul talks about the people of God becoming one body. He's giving counsel to the church about how to be one body. In his spirit, because, right, we've all been called to the glorious hope for the future. Christ is the head of this united body. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all. He talks about how Christ gave each member of the body special gifts. I love this. Dr. John McVeigh wrote a book called Ephesians. And in that book, he says, yeah, there's other books of the Bible that talk about the spiritual gifts. But Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, talks about the people being the gifts. Not that they have gifts, they are the gifts. Each member of the body is a gift. It's tempting to apply our modern understanding of these jobs, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We know that Paul taught that we're all part of the priesthood, right? This means that every single member, every single member of the body is a walking, living, breathing gift from God. So why do we feel so entitled to push some of God's gifts to the edges as if they weren't a part of the body? Why do we treat some of the body parts as dispensable to the whole 
when each and every person, every part of the body is the gift. See, we're each a masterpiece of God's creation, a masterpiece. God says we are of inestimable worth, created by Him in His image. Nothing can separate us from His love. We're children of His kingdom, part of His royal family, saved by the Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. Yes, this includes, by the way, the women. The physically and mentally challenged, the LGBT communities, and those who are just a bit different. They are masterpieces. So why do we so easily marginalize and push to the edges these children of the Creator when they are, in and of themselves, gifts from God? The Gospel of John records Jesus talking about the vineyard. He said that he was the grapevine, his father's the gardener, and we are the branches. Who does Jesus say does the pruning? They have to be pruned to bear fruit. Who does the pruning? It's the gardener, the father. The gardener does the pruning, so why do the branches seems so intent on knocking each other off the vine, like as if it's the branch's job to do the pruning. How can a branch stay focused on the vine and in the vine if it's spending all of its time trying to knock all the other branches off the vine? It doesn't work that way. Paul would have known about Jesus' story of the vineyard, and here he is, addressing the church at Ephesus to try and help them learn how to be united. Not uniform, because everyone's given unique gifts, but united in their cooperation as body parts of one body or branches of one vine. So this isn't easy, right? We humans are individualistic. We're attached to our own opinions, our own habits, our own ways. And it's not enough that we like our own independence. We want to impose our opinions, our ways, our habits, our views on other people as well. We've all seen the silliest of arguments, right, in the body. I had the privilege of attending Evensong at both Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's Cathedral during a visit to London. My husband and I loved that part of our trip. Sitting in the choirs at both services, I breathed in the soaring music, the majestic surroundings of buildings that have long stood the test of time, the formal words and language of the message (laughs) that lifted my soul. I did not want to leave that space. I wanted to stay right there. But the music that we've been experiencing here is amazing. There's nothing that can bring me into a posture of worship. Like these worship songs that are spoken directly to the Creator from our hearts. I can easily imagine both of these types of music being performed on the sea of glass. Why choose just one? Why insist that my preference, my favorite thing, is the only good way? We can grow both red and green grapes in the same vineyard. (laughs) I have a friend who has a vineyard. I checked on that. It's true. It sounded like a good idea, but I wanted to be sure it was true. It is. (laughs) Guess what the grapes do? They just grow grapes. That's all they do. They bear fruit. That's their job. It's really tempting to try to do the work of the gardener, the pruner. Social media and web platforms make it easy to sling those pruners around without a lot of care and thought as to what damage is being done to other branches. So I have a DeWalt electric pruner. I love that thing. (laughs) I I use it to do tough pruning, usually on uh, our blueberry bushes. 
Those branches can resemble tree trunks. They're pretty big. They grow really thick. The last time I used these, I recognized they're pretty dangerous. My husband stopped the whole proceedings of pruning blueberry bushes and said, you know how sometimes when you're in the yard, something bad happens and you wish you could just have those last like five or 10 seconds of your life back to do over again? <laughs> Let's not do that today. <laughs> That electric pruner will take out a good-sized branch with no more effort than it takes to type and post a few sentences of pruning words online. They're dangerous, very dangerous. Why do we do that? Why do we spread negativity about one another, other branches, like as if we're not doing damage in the process? Is it to try and be the only branch on the vine? Don't we know that if we're the only branch, the harvest will be very, very small? Being one body with one spirit, one head, one Lord, one gardener, requires body parts, branches, to support one another, to grow, to focus on the head, the vine, and simply bear fruit. The gardener takes care of the vineyard, it's simply not our job to prune one another or to amputate body parts. So, Icky and I clearly did not talk before this because my last story is a basketball story. <laughs> Hope you're up for it. <laughs> when our daughter Sydney was in the sixth grade, she was close to the six foot height that she is now. The girls' basketball team took one look at her and said, yeah, she'd be a great addition to our team. Sydney is a brilliant musician. You also see where this is going, don't you? She sings like an angel, plays any and every instrument you put in front of her, and she sings harmonies I can't even hear. She's incredible. She is not, however, an athlete. And she knows this. I've known this about her since she was a toddler. She didn't do anything until she could do it perfectly. At 15 months, she didn't walk. The following day, she ran. She had to be able to do it perfectly before she would even try. That kid was so strong when she first started walking, it was just off to the races. <laughs> But her running has always been reminiscent of a golden retriever puppy. <laughs> all arms and feet and legs and everything going all in different directions. <laughs> and Sydney joined the basketball team. Right? Hallelujah is right. It was a very frustrating experience for her. She couldn't see the point in this game at all. She's like, why are we just all throwing a ball around back and forth and back and forth, running and getting tired all in the same room? She truly just found, she fought disinterest in the game from beginning to end. She would much rather have sung the national anthem and sat down. <laughs> but she wanted to be part of the team. She was gifted, just not at basketball. But she loved her team. For their first away game, she proudly got on the bus and was so excited to go away with the team. Of course, we had to like drive in the car behind because, I don't know, parents of student athletes, does it work like this? They, they want you there, but they don't want you to pretend like you know them. Is that how it works? Well, it did with that team. <laughs> the opposing team took one look at Sydney and assumed that she was the one that they needed to be worried about. She was the threat, right? <laughs> it didn't take too long into the game, however, before they figured out she wasn't exactly the threat that they had imagined. She ran up and down the court with the team, but she wasn't really effective on either end of the court. But Sydney's team didn't attempt to prune her or push her to the edges. She was part of the body, and she played. And then it happened. She found herself holding the ball, and everything stopped and kind of went silent. 
she took the shot. And it went in. <laughs> it went in. I was such a proud mother. It wasn't exactly a swisher, and it definitely wasn't a beautiful layup, but it went in. It was a two-point basket. Her entire team surrounded her with hugs and high fives. The game stopped. People were screaming. Parents were cheering. The opposing team stopped playing and came over to congratulate her because they figured out something very special had just happened. That's the only basket she made the whole season. <laughs> Clearly, I've never forgotten what that felt like. But they never cut her off as if she was irrelevant to the body. Never. Sydney did not elect to join the basketball team the following year. Um, band and choir were clearly where her giftedness lied, and she, she went that direction. But she's never forgotten how they celebrated the fruit of that one two-point basket. She was part of the team, part of the body, a valued branch. Imagine the fruit that we could bear if we acted as one body, with one faith, one spirit, one Lord, one vine, one gardener. I want to stay connected to the vine, bear fruit, and I'll let the gardener do his work. <laughs>